Hi there, I'm Kevin. Let's talk about queer stuff in Jesus and this really cool idea called the trajectory of scripture and how this very simple shift in mindset can change everything. You ever heard the phrase that Christianity is countercultural, that to follow Christ is to be countercultural? Many well meaning Christians will use this when they talk about how culture is changing now, culture is shifting towards LGBT inclusion, and because the early writers of the Bible were saying that same sex relationships and interactions were wrong, that being countercultural then, it should also continue into what we see nowadays with same sex relationships, even though they're different context things, the whole nine yards, but you know, do you get what I'm saying? In the next video, I'm actually going to start addressing the actual biblical narratives and the clobber passages that people talk about and how I personally navigate those things. But for now, I want to talk about one big idea that we have to, that we've kind of been talking about this entire time, but really, this is how it's summed up for me in a really easy way, and it's called the Redemptive Movement Hermeneutic. Uh, this is a concept that was popularized by William Webb in his book, uh, Women, what is it? Slaves, women, and homosexuals. The idea of this hermeneutic is not so much to look at individual scriptures on their own as they are in our context, but to look at them in context of their original setting and seeing how that was um, progressive or redemptive even for the time in which they were written. If we read scripture regarding slavery and the position and treatment of women as it is now, those seem really regressive for how we treat people today. For the time and culture in which they were written, they were actually super progressive. And because we are trusting ourselves, we are listening to the Holy Spirit and letting our experience drive us back to scripture for reinterpretation, this is exactly what happens with the redemptive movement hermeneutic, is that we are able to see for the time in which it was written um, to treat slaves kindly to uh, not abuse your wives or treat them as property. That's a pretty progressive idea for the time in which it was written. And thus we have the support for the abolition of slavery and gender equality today. Now granted, Webb's book does kind of double down on LGBT exclusion because in the Bible, because scripture was preaching against this, in the mind of that author, this means that we should continue that same thing. Rather than going towards greater inclusion, we should actually work towards greater exclusion of LGBTQ identities. Because they'll say in this argument, again, around being countercultural, that um, the early Christians rejected homosexuality and that the culture of the time, Greeks and Romans, accepted homosexuality. But to say that the Greeks and Romans of that era accepted homosexuality is a little bit misleading. Greeks and Romans of that era did accept certain same-sex erotic behavior, provided that it fit within a patriarchal gender stereotype. So there were certain acts that would happen all the time people who were in power using sex as a way to dominate another person, either a master and slave relationship through pederasty, and then also some things that other people just didn't approve of, like prostitution. And these rejections of same-sex interactions were not rejecting homosexuality in the modern sense of how we think of homosexuality. They were rejecting things like using sex to dominate another person or exploit them. It was a rejection of promiscuity in favor of monogamy. I think what we need to remember is that what's pointed out in the Bible, the things that have prohibitions against them, are not the same kind of same-sex relationships we're talking about today. At that time, same-sex relationships were usually one person with greater power dominating another person, using their power to exploit that other person, using sex as the means to do that. And even though a same-sex relationship in the modern sense was not what the ancient writers had on their mind when they were talking about this stuff, I think it stands to reason to point out that the things that Christians are looking for, like mutuality, monogamy, covenantal love, those things are present in many same-sex relationships today. Now it's very easy to argue that the the conversation around LGBT inclusion and women is not the same conversation. And yes, while there are many differences that we have to talk about when we're navigating this conversation, they're rooted in very similar things. Because these prohibitions against same-sex relationships were rooted in patriarchal gender norms, the New Testament's elevation of women undermines those patriarchal gender norms and thus I believe, and many scholars and theologians believe, that this also undermines the argument against LGBT inclusion in the church. And just to make it biblical, let's include some scripture to go along with this. So while there weren't any sort of self-identifying LGBTQ people because we did not have the language to really talk about our experiences surrounding sexual orientation and gender identity until the last 50-ish years of research and study, there were still people in the Bible who were sexually different. I'm talking specifically about eunuchs and barren women because at the time celibacy for any reason uh, was stigmatized and not being able to bear children. That was a big deal too because the blessing of God was passed on through children and male children were seen as a gift from God. 
yada, 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 patriarchy. It was actually stated in Deuteronomy 23 that eunuchs and barren women could not enter the presence of God because they were unclean. Now we fast forward to Jesus and the advent of the church. Anyone can become a part of the family of God. Doesn't matter uh, what tribe you were born into, whether you were ceremonially clean or unclean, whether you kept kosher or not. And that's a big deal. Basically, by grace, through faith, we are saved. We are brought into the family of God. And that is a big deal. That means that even sexually different people, like eunuchs and barren women, can be welcomed into the family of God, regardless of their cleanliness or uncleanliness by ceremonial law. And it also stands to point out that one of the very first converts to the church was an Ethiopian eunuch who was racially different and sexually different than anyone who had been a part of the house of Israel or the nation of Israel before. And if we look at Isaiah 54, God even names eunuch in who God was going to include. It says um, from the book of Isaiah, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant with them, to them I will give within my temple a new name that is better than daughters and sons. And that to me is way beyond what ceremonial law has said before about them, right? And for me, when I also read that, a name better than daughters and sons I feel like in some way speaks to non-binary folks. It speaks to trans folks. And like I'm applying modern context to an ancient text and there's a bunch of things you can, you know, poke in that. But just like at face value, it's like, wow, like the sexually different are being offered a place in the kingdom of God. And that is huge. Does that mean that scripture explicitly affirms LGBTQ identities? No, because there are no actual LGBTQ identified people in the Bible. People like to speculate with things like David and Jonathan or Naomi and Ruth or uh, a number of different kinds of things. But again, we didn't really have the language to talk about sexual orientation or gender identity until the last 50-ish years when we began to study this stuff. And on top of that, it's still a notoriously hard field to study because it relies completely on self-reporting. So while eunuchs and barren women don't kind of neatly parallel LGBTQ identities, it is still an important point to make that one at one time sexually different people were not offered a place in the kingdom of God until God was doing a new thing in the New Testament with the church. The way I kind of sum it up this way is that we've been waiting on the revelation of the Holy Spirit. As the body of Christ has had the capacity to receive, as we have had new understandings about the world and our place in it, as we've gotten new information through science, technology, and our own experiences, we're then more apt to ask the Holy Spirit, you know, was this for a time or is this for eternity? Or what does what is really God's heart for, you know, people of color? Are they really meant to be slaves or are they meant to be our brothers and sisters? What about women? Are they meant to be subservient to men or are they meant to stand in tandem with men? And what about queer people? Are they supposed to be just this other community? Is something about them broken? Well, I'd argue no. And I would argue that this is a, just another step in the evolution of the church towards greater inclusion, which is what scripture has always been doing. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to watch the rest of the stuff in this series, go ahead and click the playlist on this little page here. And then go ahead and like, share, and subscribe. I'd love to hear from you, so leave a comment below. I'm on all the social media. Those links are below, and I'd love to connect with you on the blog. And if you wouldn't mind commenting what you think about this video, what questions do you have, I'd love to start sourcing from you guys what you need in these videos. Thanks again so much for watching, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye. <laughs>